The Lord be with you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Good morning and welcome to our online worship service today at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church. We are delighted that you can join us from wherever you are and we celebrate the fact that through the power of the Holy Spirit we are united in worship even though we are separated from one another. Uh, I just want to mention again, as I did last week, that the Augusta Community Prayer Garden is now complete and available for you to enjoy, and I hope that you will share the news of that with everybody you know. We want this to be used. We want it to be a blessing to our community as people come to this beautiful natural sanctuary and enjoy the peace and solitude and quiet that are here and spend a little time meditating on their life with God and what God is doing, even in the middle of all the chaos uh, around us. We want it to be a real place of rest and, and peace, and I hope that you will find time to enjoy it. I also want to say a big thanks to Betsy Penrow and her crew. They collected about 600 pounds worth of food for uh, Gap Ministries, and if you missed that opportunity last week, they'll be doing that again this coming Tuesday here at the church at the Fellowship Hall, I think from 11 to 2. So uh, if you have other canned goods you want to bring, uh, go ahead and bring them and we'll send them on to Gap uh, as well. It is Memorial Day weekend and we take special note today of all those who gave their lives for our freedom and we are so grateful uh, for every freedom that we have but especially the freedom that we have to worship God openly and freely without fear of persecution. It would not be possible without the blood shed by those who gave their lives for this nation and we should always remember their sacrifice. Will you join me now in our invitation to worship from Psalm 36? How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us now and open our hearts and minds and souls to what you have to say to us this day. Unite us by your Spirit that even though we are distant from one another, we are together as close as we ever can be because of the communion that we have through the Holy Spirit. Let your words infuse our life and let us live in such a way that the name of Jesus is lifted up and that all will know that we have spent time with him this day. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Our opening hymn is Eternal Father, Strong to Save. When we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea, O Christ, the Lord of hill and plain, for which our traffic runs amain, by mountain pass or valley low, wherever. Shield in dangers are from rock. 
and tempest, fire and foe, protect them wheresoe'er they go. Thus evermore shall rise to thee, glad praise from air and land and sea. And now we come to a time of confession and we remember that the Lord has promised if we seek his face and humble ourselves, he will heal us from our transgressions and he will heal our land. It is a great promise and one that can be fulfilled whenever we engage in the power of confession. So let us join together in this prayer. Heavenly Father, in your mercy you have called us from darkness to light. You did not ignore our sin, but through the sacrifice of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, you atoned for all our iniquities. Give us truly repentant hearts, O God, that we may be hungry for your word and eager to walk in your ways. Let all our joy be found in you and renew us by your Holy Spirit that we might love one another as we have been loved in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. This saying is true, and you can bet your life on it, that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners like me and you. He himself carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin and alive to righteousness and to all that is good. And I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you and I are truly, truly forgiven. And as we come to our time of prayer, I want to ask you to be in prayer for the family of Amy Smith. She was a student and a friend of Carolyn Lee's, and she recently had to undergo surgery on her brain for a tumor, and unfortunately she succumbed to complications and has passed away. Uh, she leaves a family behind who are grieving in this strange time, and so I just ask you to lift them all up uh, in your prayers. Also be in prayer for a friend of mine, Sorel Ziegler, and his family. His father passed away recently from the COVID virus, and I know this has been exceptionally difficult for them. Please keep them uh, in your prayers. Uh, be in prayer for Betsy Penrose's son-in-law, uh, Thomas Geisen, who is hospitalized with uh, serious illness right now, and we just want to lift him and his family up in prayer. And especially today, we want to remember the... I guess it's close to 1.4 million American service members who have died in defense of this country since our, our founding. They gave us our liberty, and it is up to us to figure out whether or not we can keep it. We need to remember that sacrifice. We need to honor those who are currently serving and who are putting themselves in harm's way every day. And we need to remember that our freedom has been given to us, not for our sake, but for the sake of Jesus Christ. I know we have all, all have other things on our minds this morning, so this is the time and this is the place. Let us go to God in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we gather ourselves before you this day and we ask that you touch us in the places that need the most healing.
We gather to praise you, Father, in the middle of this strange storm that is swirling all around us, that has claimed so many lives and that has devastated so many others. We pray for those who are struggling on the front lines of this thing to bring health and safety to those who are suffering from it. We do pray for those who are striving to find some kind of vaccine or cure. Remind us, Father, that with or without a vaccine and with or without a solution to this, that you are still God, that you are sovereign over every storm that comes into our life, whether it comes from the air and the wind and the sea or whether it comes from a virus or whether those storms come from the junk of our own lives. And we confess, Father, that there are storms in our lives that come from our own sinfulness. There are storms that we have inflicted upon others, and there are storms that others have inflicted upon us. And we struggle to understand and to see your goodness and your grace in the middle of all that. And we ask you, Father, to be merciful to us and to pour out your Spirit upon us. Give us a sign of your goodness and a taste of your glory, even in the middle of our trials. Father, we pray especially for those who are suffering in isolation, for those who are depressed and are wondering where there is any reason to keep on living. We know that this is an exceptionally stressful time, Father, and so we pray that you would show us and lead us how to reach out to others as you bring their names to our hearts, that we might touch them in your name and remind them that they are loved, that they are made in your image, and that they are priceless in your sight. Father, forgive us when we treat others as less than priceless. Forgive us when we demean others because their views are different from ours. Forgive us when we use this freedom that has been bought so preciously in ways that do not honor you. Remind us that our ultimate freedom has been bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ and that what we are free to do is not whatever we jolly well please but we have been set free to live as the people you created us to be, no matter what our circumstances are. So, Father, help us to lean in to that freedom. Help us to rely on your Spirit. Help us to reach out to one another in love and in compassion and in service. Help us to remember that it is okay to give up our own convenience and our own resources and our own time so that our brothers and sisters might be equipped to live better, that they might see a bit of your goodness in the way that we respond to that love. Father, we have made a mess of this world, and so we ask you to show us how we can, in step with your spirit, try to put things right. We know that none of it will be put right perfectly until the day our Lord returns, and we pray that you would hasten that day. We long for his return, and we hope that until that day, we would be faithful stewards of what you've entrusted to us, and that you would live, live through us in a way that points others to him, that they might know the hope and the peace and the joy that come to those who belong to you. We lift all these things up to you for your keeping and your care, and we praise you this day in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us that when we pray, we should say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the 42nd chapter of the book of Isaiah, verses 5 through 7. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. And from the first chapter of the book of Acts, the first 14 verses. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them 40 days, during 40 days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit. Quicken our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us this day, Lord. And in hearing, let us be joyfully obedient to your call. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I have a trivia question for you this morning. When does the Easter season actually end? Now, I know some of you are thinking it ends whenever you take those pastel-colored plastic eggs down out of the trees in, you, in your front yard, but it actually ends next Sunday, which is Pentecost, which comes 50 days after Easter. And during this Easter season, we've been looking at the various occasions that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. Luke tells us here in the first chapter of Acts that he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Luke summarizes what we've already studied, how all four Gospels tell that Jesus showed up in the flesh a number of times, both to individuals and to groups, and that they were amazed by the concrete reality of his physical resurrection. You know, Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to P Peter and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. 
You know, there are those who say that the resurrection was not physical, it was just spiritual in nature, and that after Jesus died, those who followed him were just so inspired by his example that they felt as though he had been physically resurrected. And there are others who say that disciples just experienced some kind of temporary collective delusion and they just thought he had risen from the dead. And both of those views are frankly nonsense. They don't square up at all with the substantial record of evidence that was recorded within a relatively short time after all these things took place. And they don't explain how these disciples went from being a group of cowering, frightened nobodies who had evidently backed the wrong guy, to being people who were absolutely fearless in the face of whatever opposition came their way, as well as being absolutely convinced of this critical truth that Jesus Christ had arisen from the dead in the flesh. And Paul says in that letter, which was written about 20 years after Jesus was crucified, which is a blink of the eye, he states that the Lord appeared to 500 believers at one time and that even though some had died, most of them were still alive. Then the point he's making is that if you don't believe me, you can go ask them. There are a slew of eyewitnesses to this thing. The, be- the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ is the bedrock of what we proclaim, and it is not something that you have to turn your brain off in order to understand. It is a matter of faith, yes, but it is not faith alone. There is a remarkable amount of contemporary evidence both for his life and for the fact that his followers believed that he had risen from the dead. And as Paul puts it further in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he said, if Christ has not been raised then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have died in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. And the truth is, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Christianity is an absolute hoax and has no value whatsoever. Our faith makes no sense apart from the resurrection. Without the resurrection, following Jesus makes no sense at all. Okay, Rev. Ed, you have made your point. So what? Well, as Luke points out, it's been 40 days now since the resurrection and the disciples are getting antsy. They say, Lord, now are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel. They are still in love with the idea that Jesus is going to establish his physical kingdom on earth with Israel at the center of it and that he's going to do it right away. And the truth is that one of these days he will. But this was not that day and obviously that day has not come yet. Jesus says to them, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He's basically saying, y'all don't need to worry about when the kingdom is going to be established in all its fullness. Your job is to be witnesses to me beginning here and going throughout the whole world. And you know, we really, really need to hear this now. Because so many folks get so wrapped up in all the business of prophecy and prediction of trying to figure out when Jesus is going to return and how that's going to happen and what the signs are and how it's all supposed to go down. And they get so involved in that that they seem to forget the part about being witnesses for Christ. And then there are others who get all wound up about the promise Jesus made that his followers would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they focus entirely on what that phrase might mean. And they emphasize things like speaking in tongues and having some kind of ecstatic spiritual experience as though that were the purpose of the gift of the Holy Spirit. You need to hear this. Paul writes in Romans 8, 14, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And we've talked about this before. Being a son of God means to be adopted into the divine family. When you come to faith in Christ, you do so through the work and the power of Holy Spirit. It can't be done apart from that. And the Holy Spirit then takes up residence within you. 1 Corinthians three sixteen. do you not know? that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells within you. The baptism of the Spirit is what happens, it's what occurs when you are united with Christ through faith by grace. And now depending on how you respond 
to the Spirit. Depending on how you walk, either in step with the Spirit or contrary to the Spirit, you will have either a greater or lesser experience of the Spirit. But you won't have any less of the Spirit himself. He's always there. It's just a question of how much you allow the Spirit to fill and direct and govern your life. So what does Jesus say is the result of the coming of the Holy Spirit? He said, you will receive power. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Power, that's great. Power for what? You will be my witnesses. The power of the Holy Spirit is given so the followers of Jesus will be faithful witnesses to Jesus. We're not trying to persuade people of stuff. We're bearing witness to what we know. And what we know is that we can bear witness to his life and to his teaching, to his miracles, and especially to his death on the cross for our sins and his resurrection from the dead. We are not bearing witness to the church. We are bearing witness to Jesus Christ. We bear witness not merely with our words, but with our lives. And people who truly believe Jesus rose from the dead live differently from those who don't. See, if Christ is risen, then everything he said, everything, is absolutely true. In fact, it's the only thing that you can believe in this world that is absolutely true. And that is a great comfort given how much misinformation and fake news and chaos is swirling all around us all the time. The Holy Spirit enables us and empowers us to lead lives that slowly but surely begin to resemble the life of Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, the 22nd verse, I know you've heard this, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the gift of the Spirit. These are Christ-like qualities and should be evident in all those who belong to Christ. And if this is not happening in your life, then you need to take a closer look at your heart and find out whether or not you have truly believed in Jesus. Or if you just believe a bunch of stuff about him. There is a difference. And if you truly believe in Jesus but are not seeing this character development, then you have to ask yourself... What it is that you are doing that is hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in transforming you into the image of Christ. And Jesus says this witnessing will take place in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He's talking about this process that begins on the day of Pentecost as the disciples start to bear witness to Christ. And that witness goes out to the whole world. And that's where we come in. We are called to bear witness to Christ just as those first disciples were, but obviously we're not in Jerusalem or Judea or or Samaria. We're someplace else. But what we need to envision is a series of concentric circles. From the disciples' perspective, at the very center was Jerusalem, and then you go out into Judea, and then into Samaria, and then to the end of the world. And we need to think about how those concentric circles work in our life. Think about the pattern of your life. You live in a certain place with certain people. You live in a certain neighborhood. Uh, You routinely come in contact with other folks as you go to work or go to school. Or if you're retired, you go do what you want to do. Remember what Jesus said from Matthew 28, we talked about this last week, when he gave what's called the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. And we talked about how that literally means as you are going, as you go along your journey, as you go along your way, as you follow the pattern of your life, make disciples. In other words, the routine rhythm of your life, beginning at home and then working outward into all the various circles of interaction that you have is where the business of disciple making begins as in all your ways you bear witness to Jesus Christ. This is the fulfillment of that passage from Isaiah 42. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you and I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, 
From the prison, those who sit in darkness. We bear witness to the light of the world and we take it to a world that is plunged in darkness. You know, you may have heard of a scientific theory that is referred to as the butterfly effect. And it's based on the work of Edward Lawrence and some other scientists. And the butterfly effect describes how computer prediction models of weather events like tornadoes and hurricanes are greatly altered by seemingly small and apparently unrelated actions that happened before, such as a butterfly flapping its wings miles and miles away. Now that's a gross simplification, but you get the point. This world is absolutely interconnected. And the bottom line is that our actions have far greater consequences than we possibly imagine or than we typically realize. And the greatest consequence of your life and mine is the impact that we have on others. I want you to listen to this from, from C.S. Lewis. It's a little bit of a lengthy quote, but it's worth listening to the whole thing. He put it this way when we're pondering the mystery of glory in the Christian life. He says, it may be possible for each of us to think too much of his own potential glory. Hereafter, it is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest and most in uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you only now meet, if at all, in a nightmare. All day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics, all conduct. There are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object that will ever be presented to your senses. Friends, as unlikely as it seems, the Lord Jesus Christ has called and commissioned you and me to bear witness to him by sharing the good news of his life, his death on the cross for our sins, and his resurrection from the dead, and to live faithfully in the power that he gives through the Holy Spirit. You know, the disciples met after Jesus ascended. They met and they prayed fervently for that power. And, O oh Lord, we pray today, send that power now that your glory might be revealed in all the earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we do ask for that power. We do ask for the full immersion that is ours in the Holy Spirit. Cleanse away everything in our lives that is unpleasing to you, that we might live as lights in the world that you have placed for your glory, not for ours. Let us live humbly but boldly as we seek to take the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection to the whole world and grant by your Holy Spirit that the work that we do would be shaped into something that honors you. Forgive us of our multitude of sins, both as individuals and as a corporate people, and let us put away everything that hinders our expression of faith in you. We are not worthy of this task, but we are honored that you have chosen us, and we ask that you show us how to live it out day by day, remembering that you are with us always, even to the ends of the earth. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
I do want to thank everyone for their continued support of St. Andrew, and I encourage you, if you've not yet had a chance to do so, it is possible to either mail in your contribution or to make it online. We are continuing to support about a dozen ministries, both local and uh, overseas. Uh, in addition to things like Gap Ministries and Thornwell Orphanage, we support counseling centers, we support support networks for women with cancer, we support a missionary far on the other side of a globe in an extremely dangerous place. And your support is absolutely necessary in making those things happen. Uh, will you join me now as we affirm together what it is that we believe by using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. <clears throat> have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Sounded forth the trumpet that shall never go retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With a glory in his being that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. While God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Will you join me now in our charge from the sixth chapter of Micah? He has showed you what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace this day, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>